and get some answers. Uh, very, been very much looking forward to uh, this presentation because we did have a, a lot uh, of information out on Purple Martins uh, this summer and I've been hearing a lot about it and I'm interested in hearing what we did learn. And so our conservation biologist, Jenny McFarlane, is going to be sharing that with us today. And uh, Jenny, how about if I uh, turn it over to you? Thanks so much, Jenny, for uh, all the work that you do in, in putting this together, all the different bird surveys, important bird areas, and um, it's just uh, such an integral part of what Tucson Audubon does. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you all, everyone so much for joining us here today for this uh, presentation on Desert Purple Martins and what the Tucson Audubon Desert Purple Martin Project found for our pilot study year of 2020. Uh, I do want to first point out that um, several of my colleagues for Tucson Audubon are also on this talk. So if you do have questions while I'm going through the presentation, I tend not to look at the chat window while I'm going uh, since the PowerPoint fills up most of my screen. So if you do have questions and you want to type them into the uh, chat box there, both Olia Phillips and Jonathan Horse are on this chat, you know, on this presentation um, as well. And Olia especially was very involved in what was going on this summer um, doing this study. So they can answer any questions in real time if you'd like. Or I am really going to try to save time for you know, spoken questions at the end. Try not to fill the full hour with the talk. It's always challenging for me, though. I tend to, I tend to go on. Uh, well, thank you so much, and let's see if I can share my screen here. Okay. Screen two. All right. All right. How's that look? I I don't see anything, Jenny. Okay. Oh, there we go. So I didn't hit share. Okay. How's that look? <laughs> Can you see the, the presentation now, Luke? There, there you go. Okay. Yep. Yep. So we're going to be talking about Desert Purple Martins and the, the project that we did here at Tucson Audubon this summer and what we found for 2020. So America loves purple martins. This has uh, become very apparent to me over the last few years. Uh, being from Tucson, this is not something I was totally aware of my whole life, but America loves purple martins. And this is, I thought, was a particularly good example of that. So this is a quote from John James Audubon in the 1840s, where he said, almost every country tavern has a martin box on its upper part of its signboard. And I have observed that the handsomer the box, the better does the inn generally prove to be. So I thought that was really fun that even in the 1840s you have this this phenomenon of someone like John James Audubon who loved you know all the birds specifically calling out martins and there's this lovely illustration of um, purple martins and also pointing out the fact that the general population loves purple martins and this is something that's still true today that it's not just birders that are enchanted by these amazing uh, birds it's the general population people love love, love purple martins. And that's why I've, I have fallen in love with them as well this summer. So purple martins of the East um, are a very different phenomenon than what happens in Arizona with purple martins. And there's a lot of very detailed um, information gathering that happens with studies in the East. And there's also just more of a, of a presence of martins, I think, in people's in lives in the Eastern part of the United States, where people, it's very common for folks to put up these big nesting structures and uh, these to attract these colonially nesting birds, these purple martins that will come nest in groups. And these are some lovely photos of what those look like in the East. And we've also been very fortunate this year for this pilot study of the, the Desert Purple Martin Project to have some really good partners where we've become part of the, the Purple Martin Working Group, which is quite a new group and it's been so great to have uh, some partners who, some of whom are here today on this talk where we have, you know, Jason Fisher from uh, Disney Conservation has been a huge help in this project in terms of connecting people, uh, connecting us with great partners and giving us lots of good information. 
Joe Segrist from the Purple Martin Conservation Association has been super helpful. Kevin Frazier, who will appear later in the talk <laughs> from the now University of Manitoba, and Bill Peachy, who is a local um, saguaro guru, has been, uh, we're all members of the, and just not about members of the Purple Martin Working Group, and this has been such a great support network for uh, the work this year and into the future. And this working group is now very interested in looking at the three distinct subspecies of purple martins that occur in uh, the United States, in you know not just the the eastern one, which has been absolutely, I mean, for good reason, an absolute headliner bird. But uh, we've been investigating some of the other subspecies. So purple martins are a phenomenon that people love in the United States, but from the martin's point of view, these are birds that live in a hemisphere. They don't just live in North America, they're very much hemisphere level birds. And what I mean by that is this is a range map of purple martins in the United States. And uh, this is from you know, a standard field guide range map where the, uh, the, the orange color is the breeding area, the yellow is a migration area. But if you look at a hemisphere level map, they these are birds that really move quite a lot. They have a very long migration for such a small bird. They have a very rigorous migration route that they uh, do every year where they winter, not just in, they're not in Central America, but all the way into South America. They will winter and then travel all the way to North America to nest. So really amazing long distance uh, migrant birds that from their point of view, they live in, in a, a hemisphere, not just a continent. So this is an eBird map. So I just want to show you a little bit what's going on here. This is one of those new, really interesting eBird maps that you can just view for very many, lots of species. If you go to eBird.org into that um, science tab, they have these maps for many species and they're just adding more all the time. But this is the one for Purple Martin and these are animated uh, maps and how they work is uh, it's showing us both abundance with color. So yellow being sort of present, but minimally abundant, all the way to purple being very abundant. And then it has this scale of time right here. So it's going from January through December. And this is going to be an animated presence map. So let's get it going. There we go. Okay. So it's showing both abundance, location, and time. So this is really neat. So we're gonna watch these again. I think these always do well with two views. Okay, so they're here in Florida and then they surge into the east. Then they later surge into the west. This is another big thing we're gonna talk about with the desert martins. And then they start migrating down, become abundant as they migrate through Central America and then into South America for the winter. So what we saw on that map was a different strategy of movement for these three different subspecies of martins. So this is a, a little range map from uh, the National Geographic Field Guide to Birds. And any most birders have a bookcase full of different field guides and books because each has their own strengths. To me, one of the absolute greatest strengths of the National Geographic Field Guide is it has these really well done maps of subspecies. And this is gonna be particularly relevant <laughs> for what we're talking about today since we're really teasing out these three distinctive subspecies, one in particular, and their location is huge in telling them apart. So this is showing that there are three subspecies of purple martin. They're all one species, but three different subspecies, where the eastern, you know, two thirds of uh, the United States has the subus subspecies. So that's, you know, Prognis subus subus. So this is sort of the, um, you know, the archetype purple martin, the first described of the subspecies. And this is the, the most prevalent uh, and I think most known, most the one that people are most aware of in the United States. And then we have this one called Arbicola, which is actually the last one that was described in scientific literature of the three. But this is sort of almost, I think of them as kind of a, a Western um, forest nesting martin. So you can see them, this is a sum, it looks like a, a snag of a tree up in the forest, you know, like Colorado. Uh, you can get them above the Mogollon Rim. So in Flagstaff, they'll be nesting in Ponderosa Pine. So these are sort of higher elevation forest martins that also are wild and living in cavities and, and will use nest boxes too, we'll talk about that. But, and then of course, the one that we've been focusing on here at Tucson Audubon, since this is our Tucson area martin, is the Hesperia subspecies. So Hesperia, and here's one right here nesting 
poking a little female looking out of her nesting cavity in a saguaro since these ones are so tied to columnar cacti so both saguaros and cardons down in um, sonora sonora desert down in mexico these are columnar cacti tied nesting purple martins so very very interesting subspecies and if you're hanging out in tucson in the monsoon months that's the one you're going to see so I do want to point out that there has been some pre-work done on these birds, not very much. There's been, this has been a very understudied subspecies of a very popular bird, which is really interesting. So purple martins are very popular, but the Hesperia, what we've been calling desert purple martins, which most people call them that as a, um, that's what we'll refer to, refer to them as desert purple martins for the rest of the talk, but desert purple martins have had some work done on a scientific level. And this is a very interesting paper done by uh, Bridget Stuchberry that was published um, in the 90s called, you know, Coloniality of Breeding Biology of Purple Martins. And she did her study in Tucson, in uh, Western Tucson. And it's a very good paper. You can find it on Google Scholar. I do recommend it. And um, she just sort of did a, a two-year study, um, you know, some nest. It was a really very well done study, but besides this, I could find very little other scientific inquiry that had been done into these birds. So really gave us a lot of really interesting ground to cover in terms of things that we could discover. So purple martins in Arizona. Wow, what a phenomenon, right? Does anyone else here from the desert? Now I'm, I'm doing this talk from the point of view that some, some folks here on the, in the audience grew up in Arizona or have been from, have lived in Arizona for a long time like myself, and some that maybe have never or, or visit Arizona not during the, the hottest summer months, uh, or folks that haven't really been out here at all and seen these birds. But if you're like me and you are from the desert southwest, I was totally unaware of the purple martin phenomenon until shockingly recently because they're very limited both in where they occur and when they occur so very interesting so if you're from the desert it's, it's certainly an interesting perspective and i've spoken from a lot of people who grew up in the east and had a totally different experience than i did with martins and that's been very very fascinating to learn about as well so for martins in arizona the Ar arbicola subspecies or the forest dwelling martins are very interesting they also uh, nest in woodpecker holes just like our, our desert ones do in woodpecker cavities and cacti these ones are using woodpecker holes and trees so here's one in, a, in an aspen in colorado uh, i got these photos from ebird e people's ebird list and then in places like washington state and this photo from vancouver people have developed nest boxes that the martins will use um, so I'd be fascinated to find out more about that and see what's going on with that. Um, and that'll be a sort of an interesting partnership crossover maybe for the, for future years. But these, these Western Martins, these forest dwelling ones, non-desert ones, have a really very interesting uh, life cycle difference going on from the Eastern Martins as well. So, but here's our, our little superstars for the rest of the talk, the desert purple martins, aka the Hesperia martins. So this is a photo that was taken by Zach uh, Steinhauser, who has a uh, documentary coming out soon called Purple Haze, a conservation film. We did uh, work with Zach several years back where he came out to um, our property, Tucson Audubon's property, the Mason Center in the northwest part of Tucson and got some great footage of purple martins. Uh, nesting in the Soros and doing their their fascinating behaviors. This is one he was kind enough to share some photos and video clips with us. This is one of his photos. And this really also shows uh, something where, that is really more obvious with our desert purple martins the more you look at them is they have some physical differences from the eastern as well as the arbicola purple martins. They have very behavior differences that are really quite noticeable both in terms of migration and of course their nesting choices. But there's some physical differences too. They're smaller, they're, they're quite a bit smaller than the Eastern Martins. Uh, and the female especially has differentiations in her appearance. She's much paler. She's a really very, very pale Martin compared to the Eastern ones. I'll have some photos of Eastern ones in a few minutes. You can really see, take note of how pale this female is sitting on top of the Saora and you'll see how different that is. So we did some amazing work with Purple Martins several years back. So Tucson Audubon um, has been working on the San Pedro River, which is a river east and, and north of Tucson, that is one of, you know, the last free-flowing river in the American West. And for many years, we did all sorts of bird surveys in that area. And you can see here 
what this looks like perhaps from a bird's eye view. You have this ribbon of green, this riparian corridor with mesquite borders and then the river channel itself with cottonwood trees, and then adjacent uplands <clears throat> of Sonoran Desert. So this is the sort of thing that I think Purple Martins largely evolved with out here in the, the desert southwest of having nesting cavity availability and saguaros quite near riparian zones where they could go forage and find insects and water and whatever they needed to survive. So this is what the San Pedro looks like from the ground floor <laughs> when you're in the river itself. Quite a gentle river. Um, most parts of it you can sort of, you know, if you take a running leap, cross over the river or at least get ankle deep. But during the monsoon, which we're going to talk about, for those of you who are not familiar very much with sort of, uh, you know, southeast Arizona, the monsoon brings a lot of rain into this area and rivers can run very, very high, very, very suddenly. It's going to be quite dangerous, actually. And we spent many years surveying on the lower San Pedro River and beginning all the way back in 2006. And we did all sorts of different sorts of surveys, yellow boat cuckoo, flycatcher, willow flycatcher, and oh my gosh, so many, Greyhawk, a lot of surveys. And we did a lot of important bird area work down there. Uh, it was a big, big, very important site for native birds. We did migration surveys, upland surveys, raptor surveys, uh, owl surveys, all sorts. And there's a nesting gray hawk along the river. But we began to wonder about purple martins. We were down there during summer months, like July and August, we would see purple martins. So we started just sort of exploring it. And in 2012, we did a driving census survey along this road that paralleled the San Pedro River. We thought maybe we'd see a few hundred. We did it in the evenings since we had noticed them gathering in the evenings. And this is what we saw doing that survey. We, this is a power line along what's called River Road in Mammoth, Arizona. And there was literally thousands of purple martins just hanging out on the wires, flying all around, coming out of the uplands and saguaros to sort of socialize during the breeding time. And it was, it totally blew us away. I mean, you know, many of us um, on the crew here at Tucson Audubon are from Arizona or the Southwest and had not really experienced large groups of purple martins. And this absolutely blew us away. And we were just fascinated by them and started working a lot more with them. So here's sort of a close up of them uh, preening and getting ready for, for bedtime up on the, the telephone wires on River Road. And why is the Lower San Pedro so great for Martins, or, or the desert itself even? And it's, this shows it again. You have these saguaros right near lush riparian corridors. Now, if you're familiar at all with conservation issues in the American Southwest, sites like this are becoming more and more rare, tragically. Flowing rivers become more and more precious. Uh, but this site up near Mammoth does still have a uh, flowing San Pedro River uh, area and beautiful, Cottonwood Willow Gallery with riparian abundance right next to Sonoran Desert Upland. And this is just paradise for desert purple martins. And there's also this really interesting phenomena that happened um, while we were doing these surveys in San Manuel and Mammoth, Arizona of this pond. This was uh, a pond that has been created from a spring right alongside the river, right along River Road where all, we had all those martins on the power lines. And it became apparent to us that they were utilizing this pond and that's why we were getting such huge numbers right there along the road where they were coming in and drinking from the pond and just loving it and just totally enjoying the abundance of that pond. So this led to a partnership. I wrote a blog post about this phenomenon. I was just so taken by these birds in the sort of, you know, 2012, 2013 era that I wrote a blog post about what happened. And that formed a great partnership with Kevin Frazier, who's now we're partnering with again as part of the Desert uh, Purple Martin Working Group. And Kevin came out um, as a researcher and used endoscope technology to look into saguaros to see what he could find in terms of these very, you know, understudied Desert Purple Martins. Which is really cool technology and, and gave us an idea for what we did this year too. <laughs> and this is some of the photos that Kevin got that year inside of Saguaros along the San Pedro River. It's a Gila woodpecker in her nesting cavity with her little egg. Some alfalfa babies inside their saguaro because after all nesting saguaros are like a saguaro hotel, right? So many species utilize these cavities. Um, many species utilize these cavities in a saguaro. So here's some baby alfalfa. And then we watched that pond all summer. We, uh, after Kevin you know, went, back to, went back to his university, we watched the pond all summer and had some amazing things happen. We had these huge evening gatherings of males that would come towards the pond. And we, after doing more research on Eastern Martins, it became apparent that the females were staying in the cavities 
uh, with the eggs or with the chicks. And then the, the males would gather into these big social gatherings. And this photo that I took sort of pointing straight up in the evening has, you know, easily, you know, 800 Martins in it. And they were just gathering over the water, socializing, and then they would go communally roost down by the river. So we had such an amazing summer watching these birds. It was really fun. And purple martins, desert purple martins, I think fall short. Oh, no. Here's a big less than a minute. amazing boy Yeah, so this is a video that we did to um, promote the study, and I really think video is so important for martins because their their voices are just phenomenal. I have totally become smitten with purple martins over the course of this summer. And I liked them a lot before, and now I'm just in love with them. And their voices, but their movements are so amazing and dramatic and so different from other birds we have here in the desert. I've really just been totally taken with them, and I think video is a powerful tool because photos just do not do them justice. So. I love maps and I also love eBird. So let's, let's talk about some maps and eBird. So this is um, showing where purple martins occur in the Southwest US, okay? So this is uh, June through August. This would be hopefully showing where everyone is settled for the breeding because there's a lot of migration that happens to Arizona as well. So for the purposes of what we're talking about, I, I, I bracketed it to June and August of all years. And this shows where purple martins occur in the Southwest, and it is not everywhere. It's very, very clustered to certain areas and certain habitats. And they're up here above on the Mogollon Rim, Northern Arizona, you know, the rim that continues into New Mexico, and they're in sort of the forest areas of California, and that of course would be the Orbicola ones, the forest ones. But then you have this big cluster down here in Southeast Arizona of our desert martins. So eBird allows you to look at maps down to subspecies, if it's a subspecies that can be, you know, teased out in the field, which, which these are. And so here's a map showing the Subis slash Orbicolis. These are the forest martins slash Subis, since they are pretty difficult to tell in the field. eBird has them lumped. But these could, you could pretty safely say, except for, you know, the vagrant Subis martin that wandered in from the east, that these are going to be Arbicola martins. And they're here on the rim, mostly. And, uh, you see, they're not all that abundant in terms of this frame of view, but then when we go to a Hesperia map showing just the desert purple martins, you can see they're very, very clustered along the San Pedro River, which is where we had all those amazing photos from a few minutes ago, and especially in the Tucson area, a huge cluster in the Tucson area, and then to the Sonoran Desert west of Tucson, and very little up in Phoenix. Now, this really was interesting to me. I really only became totally familiar with this this summer, that there really is this cluster that happens in Tucson that excludes Phoenix. So why is that? So saguaros and monsoons, so saguaros and, and other columnar cacti like uh, cardones down in Mexico is or what these desert purple martins are nesting in. And so this here is a range map of saguaros, <laughs> showing saguaros. And you can clearly see here, and anyone who's ever been to Phoenix knows there are saguaros up there, but also this range map verifies that. There are saguaros in Phoenix and west going into northwest of Phoenix, but you don't get all that many purple martin occurrences up there. And it's really interesting, I think, as to why, and it has to do with the monsoon. So monsoon is a term we use a lot out here in the west for our summer rainy season, which is when we get the vast majority of our rainfall in, um, at least in southern Arizona, is during the July and August summer monsoon. So here's a monsoon rainfall map, and I didn't want to just show one map because it can really vary year to year how good the monsoon is. <clears throat> so this is a 2018 monsoon rainfall map 
blue being zero inches up to four inches of green, and then um, you start getting the 10, 12 up into the reds and pinks. So this shows that Tucson is getting anywhere from six to 10, up to 14 on the mountaintops, inches of rain in southeast, you know, in the Tucson area, and then south and west in Tucson as well in 2018, and then Phoenix being in the blue of anywhere from zero to four inches of rain. So a really dramatic rainfall difference. Here's the 2019 map, which shows something very similar. Uh, more rain in 2019 south of Tucson than the previous year, but Tucson's about the same and then Phoenix is still in the blue. And then the 2020 map, uh, Tucson was pretty low as well, immediately west of Tucson up into the, the four to five inch range, but Phoenix low. One zero to two inches. So Phoenix, on on the whole, on the average, Phoenix gets a lot less monsoon moisture than the Tucson area, than Tucson, you know, sort of south and west, and that has a huge difference for habitat in terms of the quality of the habitat and the insect availability, since that is the main uh, food for the the young purple martins, and it makes a huge difference in terms of what purple martins will use. So even though Phoenix has Sonoran Desert and it has Saguaros, it has less rainfall. So the martins are clustering in sort of the Tucson area, south of Tucson and west of Tucson. So they don't really, they're not very common up into Phoenix. Now, I think there are a few examples of some nesting, you know, up there in that area, but it is by far, far, far fewer than what you find in the Tucson area. So monitoring was a big thing that we had to figure out how to tackle strategically for our pilot study year of 2020. And this is how it works in the East. So in Eastern Purple Martin studies, it's very hands-on. You can really take a peek at what's going on inside these nests in a very, uh, in a very intimate way. So this photo up here on the upper left is showing that a Martin colony house is actually mounted on a flagpole that can be raised for the Martins to come find and then lowered when you want to examine the status of the chicks inside. So these are photos looking into nests when you could just lower it and sort of open the little door and peek in and take a photo like you can with nest boxes sometimes to see what their status is. You know, oh, okay, she's on little pink chicks and I look at my chart and I can tell these are four days old. Um, so really hands-on, really very much getting a really good look at these birds. It's a little different out here in the Sonoran Desert trying to look at purple martins because these guys are in saguaros and these cavities can be very, very high and there's not really a good way to look in there unless you're doing it. You, you, you have to go to them. They don't come to you <laughs> kind of thing. And so the one I have here on the, the left is a, is a GIF. So it's a moving photo of a, a video turned into a photo of Olia Phillips, who works at Tucson Audubon, trying to see inside of a saguaro cavity. And the martin flies in right at the end. Here's the one on the right of, of me looking into saguaro cavities. We had to use really large telescoping poles and little endoscope cameras that had Bluetooth connections to our smartphones to look inside of these cavities. And it worked. It once we got the hang of it, it worked actually quite well. But it was a totally different logistics challenge than working uh, on the east with these birds. And we also had other issues too. Of this photo in the top center here is the cryptobiotic soil crust that you find out in really high quality Sonoran Desert. It's this, um, you know, lichen, algae, bacteria crust that is on the soil and it's very sensitive to being trampled. It, you can destroy this ecosystem by stomping all over it. So we were very careful to try to avoid that and instruct our volunteers not to damage that, that, that habitat component. Uh, we had martins swooping around in very lots of anger, lots of protective anger when we were scoping these uh, cavities. And then we also had issues like trying not to uh, impact other desert nesting species during the, the breeding time. So during the monsoon, a lot of stuff is nesting. So these are some uh, poor whale eggs that we found on the ground and we marked it on the maps. So we were careful not to step on it <laughs> on our next visit. So we had a lot. And then of course there's rattlesnakes and, and extreme heat conditions. It's also the hottest months in the Tucson area. So we had a lot of challenges, but I think we got so much of it worked out during this pilot year. And we had a, some specific challenges because it is 2020, of course. We had some public safety restrictions where in terms of we couldn't do a group training, we couldn't do even a group meeting of people unless it happened online, which we did some videos, instructional videos and stuff to, to overcome those obstacles. So we had some public safety restrictions that made it difficult to sort of do, we were not able to do any really group surveys this year, although we have plans for next year. And we also had this um, 
phenomenon, which a lot of the locals are aware of, if you're anywhere from Tucson or Phoenix, called the non-soon. We didn't have a monsoon this year, we had a non-soon, but we had very, very low rainfall this summer. This was a really rough monsoon. It was much below average rainfall. And this is a map from the University of Arizona showing exactly what we're talking about. So how the how the shading on this map works is the white, if, if any part of the map is shaded white, that means it hit the average rainfall, 100% of the average. Now, how, so anything that's green or blue is above average, which <laughs> nothing was in Arizona this year. And then um, the darker the brown is on the map, the lower the percentage mm. of the average rainfall. So the darker the brown, basically the drier it was compared to, pre, you know, to the average years. So you can see Tucson is getting pretty close to white, especially right where the Martins like, south of Tucson, west, immediately west and east of Tucson, and down into the, you know, western Pima County, west of Tucson, was way below average. And it showed in what we were looking at this year. I think this really impacted some of the behavior of the Martins and um, gave us some, some interesting things to deal with this summer. So we definitely had some challenges this year, both from the, from the pandemic as well as the, the weather this year. So the project crew, the, the Desert Purple Martin project crew was amazing. Even with all these challenges, we had so much great participation and phenomenal information that was gathered by people. And I could not be more proud and more impressed of this crew. So anyone who's um, on this, this presentation right now or watching a, a recorded video of it, thank you so much for helping. You guys were amazing. And you really came through and gathered so much amazing information. We had over 40 participants in the Desert in the pilot year of the Desert, Pur Desert Purple Martin project, and we identified 63 nesting sororos, which is a lot, and gathered you know data and information about them. We had an additional 30 nesting areas that were identified, but not pinned down to a specific sororo or nest hole, which is amazing. It's a really, really great amount of data that was gathered for a pilot year, and we also identified over 20 roosting sites. So we're going to talk about roosting and what that means. And it's when you get these gatherings of adults that, that come together and sometimes fledged juveniles as well that come together. So here's some cool photos of just some of the, the things that were collected by participants. Here's a, a female carrying an insect, to, a dragonfly to feed a fledgling. So really beautifully annotated photo of a saguaro identifying each cavity. So everyone, the people who participated, did such an amazing job. Got some mobbing martins coming around a saguaro that are a little upset that a human is looking at their nest. And then um, what it looks like, if you're a purple martin looking down at someone looking up at your saguaro, this is an endoscope photo <laughs> from looking inside. So everything we're gonna talk about from now on is fully available for uh, anyone to go and look at and look at this data very closely yourself. And if you're interested in this project or participate in the project, I would encourage you to do that because we have some really amazing information that folks gathered and we want it out there for people to look at and enjoy and sort of, uh, we'll use it as a resource for, for next year's study. So I wanted to sort of briefly go over how you can find that yourself. If you go to the, our website, the tucsonautobahn.org website, you can go directly to these links by just doing slash Purple Martin, or if from the home page, if you navigate to the venue that says get involved, and then from there, Citizen Science, and then from there, Desert Purple Martins, that'll also take you to this page that I'm about to show. So this is our Desert Purple Martin page, and if you, from, from the Desert Purple Martin page, there's a, a link to the Desert, Pur Desert Purple Martin project page. And if you go to that, uh, we've added a link that says Desert Purple Martin Project 2020 Results and Findings. So that link will take you to everything I'm going to show you right now. So everything I'm going to show you can look at yourself in far more detail, you know, and really take your time over it if you would like. So the first thing it takes you to is an online document. So this is a Google Word document, and it is very long and very thorough. And what this is, is everyone's observations who participated in this project. So folks got amazing natural history information about these birds. Since these birds are so little studied, we were interested in everything. I wanted to know what kind of insects were people were seeing bring in, exactly the timing of when they saw courtship happening or food carrying happening or anything like that. And this was People did such a good job and really came through. So we got all sorts of great observations that were written out and recorded with dates and times and photos. So you can go to this document and see everything that was gathered. It's really very, very interesting and just shows the level of, of work that all these participants put in. Really phenomenal stuff. 
And then from there, from that, that landing document, there's some links to some more interactive data viewing uh, tools that you can utilize. So here we have a, a map. These are screenshots, but you can see the, the live ones. This is a Google My Maps that you can zoom in. You can click on any of these dots and get more details. So this shows all the locations of where we had uh, nesting saguaros. So the little saguaro icons are the, the saguaros. And you can see they're not really so much in urban Tucson. And I really did look. I wanted to make sure we weren't missing urban nesting. So I did quite a bit of my own searching in urban Tucson, following up on eBird reports to see if they would nest in urban Tucson. And they do very well in suburban Tucson if it's in high quality Sonoran Desert habitat. But they were most prevalent in areas that were unfragmented pieces of Sonoran Desert, you know, at least pretty large patches of unfragmented Sonoran Desert. So they're uh, quite prevalent in the Tucson Mountains. We had them east of Tucson, some sites north of Tucson, and then quite a lot of good activity happening in the Green Valley Sarita area as well. Had a lot of really good observations come out of there and some nesting saguaros that were identified. And then the little purple icons are where we had clusters of, of Martin activity that didn't necessarily result in finding specific nesting saguaros, but ones that will follow up for next year. And then the little blue trees are roosting sites that were identified. And if you know anything about the Tucson Valley, you can see they're clustering along the major washes and rivers, which is what I expected and, and what did happen. And this is where they're gathering together, really sort of getting socializing and fattening up and getting ready to migrate. We also have a nesting timing table that's uh, available for you to look at, where we took everyone's observations and sorted them out by, uh, by week. And also each square does have the specific date of those observations, but they're sorted by week and then color coded by uh, breeding code. So this gives a visual interpretation of the timing of desert purple martins, as well as some more details uh, in there as well. So this is all gleaned from the huge amount of data that our participants, as well as Tucson Avon staff, gathered. So did a great job gathering all this data and we tried to really think of how to visually present it to be as impactful and meaningful uh, as possible since this is such a new area that we're exploring in terms of, of this species, you no know, knowledge of this, this subspecies. We have some graphs here of data that we gathered. So this is the average height of purple martin nests that we determined for our, our pilot study for this year. So out of the, the 21 saguaros where we actually measured very, very closely the exact height of the nesting cavity. Uh, you can see here, let's see here, yeah, so we have, um, we have some height data and charts as well as direction facing. This can be very important for cavity nesting species, uh, what direction the nesting hole is facing in terms of preference. Because if you've ever been in Sonoran Desert and seen saguaros, especially in healthy Sonoran Desert habitat, any one saguaro can have, you know, many holes, many, many holes that were created by woodpeckers. So these purple martins do have a choice. They have some choice element to choosing which hole they think is going to best suit them. And so they really can sort of choose a direction to an extent. And so we were very interested in what they would choose. And they really tended to have a west or northwest direction, you know, facing more than any other direction from what we found for this year. So really very very cool. And then, of course, the, the heights, which you can see here at the bottom of this chart, some were quite low, some were in the, the 8 to 10 foot height range, um, which actually made them kind of challenging to endoscope, getting my pole low enough to look inside. And then, <clears throat> but the higher the better seemed to be the thing. So anything um, sort of 15 to 20 foot level was where a lot of them were nesting, that height. We have also a chart that you can link to in that original document that gives you really detailed blow-by-blow blow information from each nesting cavity that we found. So this is the, if you're really into data tables like I am, you can really see where all this, these graphs and charts and conclusions were drawing, where they came from. This is the sort of the raw data. We also had a lot of additional help for this study this year during a pilot year, utilizing eBird from Cornell. We did put the word out to the birding communities of Southeast Arizona that we really needed help. And if you were around and you were observing purple martins, desert purple martins, to please enter what you saw, where, when you were, and any breeding codes. Like if you observe breeding behavior, please put that into eBird. And people did very well with that. And that really did help us get a lot of additional great information. So I do have one more video for you guys. And this is what, this is a collection of endoscope videos. By day, so this is a Greasewood Park nest. 
number three on July 25th. I've got three little chicks. And then I went back on August 13th and there was one huge chick in there full of very feathered chick. Okay, so this is the uh, Saguaro National Park, the Rincon Mountain District, which is east. This is the, the nest we labeled Cactus Forest number one. And there she is, a female in there sitting on three eggs on July 22nd. Here's the same nest, but she had flown out. So then the three eggs. I went back on August 6th and had three little chicks in there growing their little feathers. And then went back on August 17th and had three larger chicks, <laughs> the same three chicks that were bigger with more feathers looking a little bit more like purple martins. This is uh, cactus forest number two, the second saguaro nest we found in Saguaro National Park. It had one big fat chick and an, and an unhatched egg on July 30th. Went back on August 6th, had a, the same chick, much bigger, more feathered with the same unhatched, now you can see it's two eggs. And I went back on August 17th and that chick had left and there was two unhatched eggs. So endoscopes really were the most important tool, not the most important tool, a very important tool for watching these desert purple martins. And uh, I'm gonna be putting up some more videos of some of the nests we watched with endoscopes, videos that are done sort of in a sequence like that where you can watch them grow over time. And I think uh, the priorities for next year is we really want to expand the Desert Purple Martin survey. I thought for a pilot year, this went actually phenomenally well. We got a lot of really great data. We sorted out so many logistics on how to do this, this uh, study. And what I really want to, I think there's so much more potential. We really want to expand this survey uh, and then work with partners to do a much larger, more thorough, more scientifically impactful study. And I really want to get volunteers having the option to use endoscopes themselves if they would like. Uh, it is gonna require some training, some in-person training, which is why we couldn't really do it this year besides you know, staff doing it. Some in-person training, so we'll do some workshops late spring, early summer, uh, actual training workshops, taking around poles and endoscopes and looking into saguaro cavities, and then uh, get people who wanna do it and who have done the training onto our uh, state permit to do this work, because you do need a permit to do that. We want to focus on doing some more feather gathering. This is something we were doing with partners this year as well, where we were looking for feathers that can be uh, used in a, uh, stable isotope studies, um, isotope or uh, doing sort of toxicology studies, genetic studies, anything like that that can be done with feathers in labs uh, our partners are working on. So we really tried to get as many feathers as possible from Martins, but we weren't really capturing tagging or handling the birds at all this year. So, but we did have some success with that. Keith Wiggers did have a male purple martin that had tragically somehow fallen onto a choya and perished. So we have that bird that we're gonna be sending the feather, you know, the, the carcass up to NAU. And then Oli and I both each found um, a dead juvenile that we also collected. But we're also gonna be utilizing a lot more tools. So this is a really cool photo that was taken by our volunteer, Tim Hill and Jarris, where he found this great app where you can take a photo of a nesting site or anything, but in his case, at pointing at a nesting site of a saguaro, and it captures so much information, such as the GPS location, the directionality, and other great information. So there's a lot of new tools that we discovered and explored uh, this season that we'll be utilizing in a more expanded way next year. So roosts is the last thing I wanna talk about because it is so interesting. So these birds, they, they're, they're, their behavior is so fascinatingly different from the Eastern Martins where they nest in, you know, these cacti and this in the desert. It's so exotically different from Eastern Martins, but they do do uh, a behavior that's really quite similar <laughs> to the Eastern Martins of, of roosting. They gather into these large migration roosts. And this is an article from the Condor, it's, you know, ornithological journal. And this is an article from 1946 and it talks about desert, pur you know, purple martin roosts in Tucson and where they're located and how someone had observed that they had moved. And this is in the 40s. So I'd love to focus next year on trying to find more information on where these mega roosts are happening um, in the Tucson Valley and in west, of t and west and south of Tucson as well. So it's a really fascinating article from the 40s talking about how it had moved. And if you're from Tucson at all, you'll recognize some of these locations that they had moved from Kleindale Road to um, along the Santa Cruz River to, you know, the list specific streets and stuff. It's really interesting, but they do tend to gather along Pantano Wash and the Santa Cruz River for their large gatherings in uh, neighborhoods like Savano. So it's really interesting. I'd love to try to find these mega roosts next summer. We had some issues this year 
both with public safety concerns as well as just this this really unusually low monsoon rainfall, I think really affected their behavior this year. And I think they tended to leave earlier than they would in a normal year, because just because of poor food conditions. And I also just want to point out this really interesting phenomenon, since I know one of our partners um, on this talk is in Brazil right now, where when the Martins make it to Brazil, which they should be arriving relatively, uh, they're certainly on their way down to Brazil right now. But when they go into their wintering areas, these roosts, when they hang out in people's neighborhoods like Sabano and East Tucson, people love it. You know, for people who live in that area have contacted me over this, this uh, summer and told me about how much the neighborhood loves it. And they go and watch the martins come and roost. And I sure loved it in San Manuel, watching them roost along the river, gathering in huge groups. But down in Brazil, they're not doing it for a few weeks. They do it for six months. So imagine this happening every night right over where you park your car. Right, so it's a bit of a different phenomenon. It's a much longer term thing. So I thought that was such an interesting um, fact that I found out during our explorations this year and doing a lot of research on purple martins that the wintering grounds and can have a, the folks who have to deal with them in their wintering grounds have a little bit different situation than we have up here in North America. So I think I did manage to save some time for questions. So uh, I am gonna unshare my screen, Luke, Let's see if I can figure this out. <laughs> Can I figure it out? There, I did it. There we go. Okay. All right. So hey, thanks, any Jenny. questions in the chat that I wasn't looking at at all that we, we should tackle first? Yeah, we do have a few questions here. And um, let's start. Uh, so one of the last questions that I don't think it's been answered yet is, do the three subspecies cohabitate in Brazil in their wintering grounds? It looks That's like a, a really good question. response from, from, uh, from, uh, from Joe of the Purple Martin Conservation Association, who, who would know quite a lot more oh, about yeah. that than I would. And yeah, very little data. And that's been my impression as well as what Joe said that there's a lot more to be discovered in terms of the migration of purple martins. And technology has now gotten to the point where we can put little backpack trackers, you know, scientists can put little backpack trackers on martins and track their progress as they fly all the way to their wintering grounds and back. And that's also what the part of the reason we were looking to gather feathers, that's what that study is about, is stable isotope studies, which gives you a sense of where the feather was grown using the chemistry of, of the water that the birds were exposed to. And that's a really interesting field of of uh, field biology that's happening now is these stable isotope studies. And that's what that's about too, is trying to figure out exactly where they winter and, and their migration routes. Okay. Looks like most of the other questions were answered. Uh, Richard Carlson has a question. Richard, go ahead and unmute yourself and you can Yeah, ask I, 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 I think I'm unmuted here. Hey, yeah, you're good. You are. Yeah, good. Uh, the question I had is we were talking about doing, not banding, but putting some radio frequency visible chips uh, yes. on the martins and, and getting a tower so we could see yes. when they come by. What, yeah, that's what's such a fascinating uh, tool that we will be utilizing and that's called MODIS. So MODIS stations are these the really interesting, I had a slide about that, Dick, but I took it out because I knew I was going to go over on time. Uh, the first talk I gave on this, which is also uh, will be available online, sort of the talk we did launching this study, I do talk about MODIS in some detail on that. So if you're really curious about that, you can uh, go watch that talk. Or if you just Google MODIS, you'll see a lot of really interesting information about this, this new tool that's being utilized in wildlife conservation and, and research. Uh, you can put much smaller, lighter weight tags on a on a, on a bird or a bat or even butterflies are being uh, worked on this way right now. Technology is getting so advanced and these tools are getting so small. And what you happens is you install these MODIS towers and if you get enough, they almost look like radio antennas. If you get enough of them installed throughout a region and then they, the bird or any animal that has a MODIS tag on it will connect and ping off of that tower and that gives you information on where that bird or that animal was and when. So very exciting information that, or, you know, uh, technology that's being utilized with MODIS. And Tucson Audubon is now getting into MODIS and we'll be installing some towers as well as working with partners to see if we can get more towers installed in Southeast Arizona. Cause that's the only way MODIS works well is if you get a lot of towers set up. So very, very good question, Dick. Thank you, I'm glad you asked that. Great, thanks Jenny. We have a question about uh, about the cactus characteristics. 
And go ahead and – yeah, there we go. Hey, hey Jenny, uh, thank you. Uh, it, this was a fantastic presentation. Oh, and so thrilled about – what you guys were able to do in this difficult uh, year to start off a project and so thankful uh, as well with uh, uh, all the volunteers that are probably here watching today and hopefully uh, that uh, that team even expands from uh, what they're watching here today. But I had a question uh, about just the characteristics of uh, the cavities that the Purple Martins were using. Um, were you able to take any dimensions of, of what, you know, the ideal uh, cavity size and shape seems to be, as well as uh, um, the size of uh, the cactus, you know, the, the age or diameter of the cactus that the Purple Martins seem to be using? Do you have data that you've gathered on that? We did not gather data during the breeding season on that because the, they were pretty sensitive to disturbance. They really didn't like people being at their saguaro, even, even if you weren't poking the hole with an endoscope, they didn't really like people being at the saguaro while they were there. But we have pinpointed exactly which cavities were being used. So during the off season, uh, the winter where it's, it's more feasible to do that, we could go in and uh, get those dimensions, especially from holes that were maybe a little, a little lower, a little closer to the ground where it's possible to climb a ladder and, and sort of get some of those measurements. But saguaros are difficult. They're, they're quite spiny. They're quite, you know, once you they look real solid when you see them standing there. And then as soon as you kind of touch them, they do kind of sway a little bit. Um, so we'd have to think how to do that. But I'm sure we could gather that information. And another thing we wanted to do next year was to put in some eye button temperature um, tools into cavities to gather both temperature over time within these cavities during these extremes, extremely hot summer months, as well as humidity. Since humidity seems to be a major factor within saguaro cavities, because these are, you know, very, very insulated cacti that have cavities inside of them. So if anyone were ever to do a nest box study, you'd really want a lot of information on exactly what's going on inside a natural cavity. So that's a really good question. And we have certainly all the data to go get that additional data that you're talking about. So yeah, we'll figure out how, how to do that best. And if you have ideas on that, let's let's talk. I'd love to go gather that data. Awesome. Hey, uh, any last questions before we close up for the afternoon? Uh, yes, we like to get more involved in this. We had a mating pair just outside our yard in a desert saguaro. It oh fledged, we think, two males. And the saguaro is like 30 feet high and they were at the very top of it. So yeah, they left, yeah. they left when? They left in early August, all of a sudden they weren't there anymore. Well, if you know what saguaro they were using exactly, which I have seen oh, like yes. you, and which, if you know which hole they were using, yes. uh, it'd be great if you could take a photo of that saguaro and send it to me, like maybe with that hole circled and any information you have, like the height and the direction, uh, we can add it to our data set. Sure, great. We'll do that. Yeah, and then you then I'll, then I'll have I'll I'll put you in as part of the study as well, so you'll get all the correspondences from now on. Oh, good. Thank show. you. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Awesome. If I remember right, you're over there off of by Finger Rock Canyon. So right, right. Is it? Yeah, I think well, that's where. I, I yeah. couldn't hear that last part, Luke. Oh, I was just saying that uh, I think Joan and Alan live over there by Finger Rock Canyon. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I can get a lot of data from that area. So that'd be great to get to get that data. Most of it was from the west and east side of Tucson. Fantastic. But I, I, would, I have a parting thought, which is everyone, it was so much help for this project. We had so many people come out of the woodwork in a challenging year and really, really help with this survey and this study. And I really appreciate all the volunteers that made it possible. Uh, as well as a lot of really great staff involvement too. And I, let's see, I have here uh, a question too about uh, artificial nesting. That's part of the reason we want to gather so much information about temperature and humidity inside of, of the saguaros because that's what you're going to need if you ever wanted to attempt artificial nesting. I don't know of anyone who has attempted it so far, but it would be interesting to, uh, to, to see if that could work in the future. And we are very involved with nest box studies here in, at Tucson Audubon. So I'll, we've definitely talked about it and we've been thinking about it actively as we do this study. And if anyone, I see some people that are interested in joining the study for next year. If anyone is, please, um, we'll, we'll gather this information from the chat window, but also send me an email. Um, you can find me on the Tucson Audubon webpage under the staff. 
uh, staff tab. So send me an email and we'll get you guys uh, all, all uh, set up for being involved for next year. Great, and uh, I did record the session, so that'll be going out to everyone later this afternoon. And Jenny will be CC'd on that email as well. Yeah, so great. if you Thank need you. to reach out to her for more questions or to myself, just respond to that email. And uh, we're already looking forward to, to next year. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks great. everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate it. All right, well, we will see you again soon and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Enjoy autumn.